Well, welcome back to our third and fourth, fourth, I can't count, fourth and final session of the day. Um, and I'm, I'm excited about this one. Um, you know, when we're, we're talking about loving your neighbors and you start to get to know people and you're building relationships and things like that, you can't help but kind of stumble into bigger issues of the neighborhood um, or, you know, what, what really is going on around the community? You know, who are these people in our neighborhoods and in our community? Um, and how do we address needs? Because as soon as you're walking alongside people in those crisis or difficult moments or you're getting to know them through the struggles that they're going through, um, sometimes your eyes get opened up to even more that's happening in the community around you. Um, I think our church development staff at the conference are a wonderful resource. I've worked with them for several of them for many years and there's a lot of resources available through them. I put their INUMC web address on your resources page so you can look all that up. But uh, Randy Anderson is here today to tell us about one one of the awesome tools that they have available through Mission Insight. So I'm just going to turn it over to him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Hi, everybody. Hi. Good to be here. My name is Randy. What's your name? Joey. Okay, good to meet you. We're going to talk today about, a, about an issue that I think plugs every church. It turned out to be uh, a tremendous blessing, but as we was going through it at the last church that I pastored, it was literally hell on earth. In the last three years uh, before, I, before I went to work for the conference, um, things were going so well at that church. It was just really exciting. And then all of a sudden, two things started happening that we had no control over. In three years, 54 regular Every Sunday, members moved to heaven. Three years. And then, just about two, two miles to the east of us was a big company called Whirlpool Corporation. They chose to move to Mexico. That hit eight families in that congregation. All of a sudden, we looked out and there was a whole lot of emptiness. A whole lot of emptiness. And we began to realize that we hadn't done a very good job at replacing people over the years. I'm reminded of the last thing that Jesus said before he ascended to the Father. You know, you'd think everything that Jesus said would be pretty important, right? I mean, he taught some pretty good lessons and preached amazing sermons and that's where you learned to preach, wasn't it? When you walked with Jesus? Okay. Oh. The last thing he said was go. Go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, and do what? Make disciples. We'd been really good at doing church. Things were going really well. But we hadn't been doing really well at being the church and going and making disciples of Christ. And all of a sudden we found ourselves in a downward spiral and we began to do what any normal United Methodist Church does at that time. We reached for the panic button. At that time I was introduced to a tool that had been available to me for a long time, but I really had never paid any attention to it. And that tool is what you hold in your hand, Mission Insight tool. It's a tool that's available to every United Methodist Church. And here in the conference, it's, it's a tool that tells you some amazing information about your community. And what we found out very quickly was that our congregation did not look like our community. The people in our community and the world that we lived in was not the congregation that we were experiencing. And we had no idea. Things were well, things were good, things were solid, but when they weren't, then we began to look around. And so as we looked around in Mission Insight, we realized that we were surrounded by folk and by situations that honestly, we had no idea that existed. This tool tells you some tremendous, tremendous things. 
Dennis is going to share with us in just a moment the Mission Insight Report for this congregation here. And that will be more explanatory than I could ever be about what you can find out. But I do want to say this to you. We, we just recently worked on a church down in, in Evansville, on the downtown part of Evansville, really on the Franklin Street. Everybody know where Franklin Street is? It's where the West Side Fall Festival is going to be the first week of October. Best brain sandwiches you could find this side of anywhere. Glory to God. Anyway, this church down there, they did a Mission Insight report, and they found out an amazing thing. They found out within 10 blocks of their church was an unbelievably high divorce rate. And they began to do divorce recovery, and they began to do uh, Parents' Day Out programs, and they are picking up members constantly because they've reached into the community. They didn't realize that that was there. But when they found out that that issue was there, my goodness, they were able to tap into it and they were able to make a difference. So what I'm encouraging you to do is to take that handout that you've got. It gives you the complete step-by-step -step approach to logging into Mission Insight. And your pastor, if, you, if you're not aware of it, your pastor has all of the information that you need for that as well. And you can find out unbelievable information about your church. Dennis, how about we do this? How about you just go ahead and start the report? You got a mic back there? I you do. Need this? You do. I've got a mic. Okay. If you would just go ahead and talk through that report just a moment, that'd be really helpful. You do that? I can do that. All right. This is uh, what's called, the, there's a lot of different reports you can get through Mission Insight. This is what's called the Quick Insight. Uh, you can get a lot more detail. And I just put up three, I've got three pages to show uh, this is went in to Mount Pleasant, did a, I think it's a five mile circle, which is a good chunk of Terre Haute. Um, and one of the things this does, I'm, I'm relatively new to this part of the state, and this tells us, uh, gives you a quick uh, snapshot, a quick glimpse of uh, what the community is like that's, that's right around your church. For instance, you can see and the nice thing, you know, I'm songs and pictures kind of guy, so the color really helps a lot. The yellow, red, green, we understand those from stoplights, right? So yellow is little change, it's not going to change a whole lot. Uh, red is danger zone, um, and then the green is, is uh, significantly above. And you notice in this snapshot here in our community, the only thing that's significantly above the average is poverty. Uh, that's not a, even though it's green, that's not necessarily a good sign for your, uh, for your community. But these are just some of the things, families with children expected to decline over the next uh, several years. Uh, diversity, not a very diverse community, family income, uh, all in the decline category. And this is for, not for our church particularly, this is for the, the community that we're ministering uh, within. So then you go, you can get these charts uh, that come as well. This is over, I think, the next uh, 20 years. Uh, the top chart says population, and uh, you see the population going down. Uh, the next chart is family households with children by type. Again, children uh, here in this community going down. And these are predictions. Nobody actually knows what's going to happen, of course, but it gives you some insight and begins to give you ways to, to gear and to plan. And then uh, financial resources. Uh, by 2023, you see the state average in red. You see the, 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 our particular area in blue uh, significantly below um, the state average. So what does that mean? Then you begin to think in terms of your financial planning, your budget planning. Uh, what you can expect to see in giving um, and how you begin to approach stewardship with, with charts like these. So that's just some of the things. They'll also give you a lot of categories of uh, the demographics. I think the largest demographic in our area right now uh, has to do with debit cards, which means there's a lot of debt and a lot of spending that goes on um, in, the, in the community that we find ourselves in. So is that what you need, Aunt Randy? That works perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. See, the reason that, that all this information is valuable to you is that in church development, we find that there's a lot of, lot of folks doing tremendous programming in the churches. But part of the reason we do programming in the churches is because we've always done that programming, and 
we ask ourselves now, is that, pro is that programming really valuable to today and now? And we start scratching our head. And we think, well, why are we doing it? And we don't know why we're doing it. We just know that it's always been done. And so what we encourage you to do is to find out the context of your community. And in finding out the context of your community, maybe you're going to find that some of the programming that you're doing is not hitting that community. Remember I told you when we began looking at that at the church I was serving, we did not look like our community. We had people driving into us that was left, and those folks driving in come from an upper middle class white world. And our community was nowhere near that. And so that helped us become more aware, and it helped us to adapt and become more programmatic that met the needs of the people in our community. That's a slow process of change. But if we're really going to stop and do what we are called to do to make disciples, it goes back to, I believe it was what Allison said just a few moments ago, it's about relationships. That's what it's about. God created man for what reason? To have relationship and communion with, with, with humanity. And that we know what took place in the garden now is broken. Christ came to do what? To restore that relationship. And now what does Christ want to have with each of us? A personal relationship. It's about relationships. And the way that we're going to accomplish those types of issues of making disciples begins right within our local context. Of reaching out and, and, and getting to know one another and being willing to go into our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I really appreciate this day. This has been amazing. It's been amazing. And, and thank you, Allison and John and the ops team for, for all of this and for all your hard work, Dennis. Thank you so much. This has been an amazing day. And I hope we do, do a lot with it. And we go out and show at least one more there's reality in serving God. Bless you. I want to, has anybody like done their mission insight report with their church and implemented that here besides Mount Pleasant? Yeah. Oh, question, is that a maybe? Did you want? For your particular mosaic group? Yeah, because of mosaic groups or, or generalities, you know, for that for that demographic, you know, as far as education and, and political views and church and all of that, is that for that group, that one demo, that's the generalities for that group. So sorry, John. Put that in the synopsis in about thirty seconds. Go ahead. Has anyone? I've not heard of I turned it back off. <laughs> okay. Real quick in a synopsis, are there, are there summary slides available for the various mosaic groups that we get the information on through Mission Insight? Because they're very detailed, there's a lot of information there, and you can't go through six groups with your board because they're going to be asleep after the first two. So... The answer is, I don't think so. I don't know that for a fact, but I don't think so. But what I will do is I'll find that answer out for you, and I will let John know, and John can tell me who you are, and I'll get in touch with you, okay? But I honestly don't believe that's been done. If we, if we did that, we, what, what we need to realize is there are 1,180 churches in Indiana, United Methodist churches, and we just haven't done I think we've done some district stuff but not real in-depth. That's why each local church has 
a password and availability, but I'll find it out for you, sir. You bet. You bet. Any any other questions? What's that? You ought to talk in the microphone. <laughs> and it's Jeff Blancet, by the way, from uh, from Ebenezer and Farmersburg. Jeff, I'd be willing to work with you on creating a PowerPoint or a synopsis that would be fruitful for your congregation. But you have somebody in your church, Don Ransford, that loves to do spreadsheets. So that's another option. I, I think less is more. I mean, graphics are great, but intentional information that speaks to the greatest need that you have is the primary concern. All right. Um, so a lot of you have not used Mission Insight, and I just really want to recommend that as a great tool because I think a lot of times we make a lot of assumptions. Um, I've sat in a lot of church meetings and heard a lot of they and them and those people, but we don't always know who those people are or who they are. And so Mission Insight is a great tool that we can use as a church to really get to know our neighborhoods and what's going on out there and maybe learn some new ministries, some new ideas, um, just, you know, I think uh, some new energy into what we're doing um, by using that. So I know church development people are really awesome about helping um, with that if you have questions because I've asked them questions about it when I've used it and things like that. So um, I definitely recommend that as a great resource. Yes. Part of what we... Oh, we're getting it. Okay. Part of what we've done in the West District, we have had workshops, clergy workshops on Mission Insight. And so the district is familiar with it. However, I don't know if that's been translated to the laity getting involved in it. And if you really want to get invested into the energy of the surrounding area of your church, get involved in Mission Insight. And if you need additional assistance with that, we have persons available in the West District that could help walk you through that. And I heard a great word of advice when I was at a Mission Insight training one time from somebody that said, find a person who likes data. You know, because I, I think a lot of, I work with a lot of mission people. They're not the data people. They don't want to sift through spreadsheets. I kind of really like spreadsheets, so I'm weird. Um, but if you can partner with somebody that loves that kind of stuff, then that's when you can really use the tool. So, um, you know, find somebody in your church and say, hey, help me with this project. And then I think you can really use that to, to get to know people. So talking about assumptions, we're going to hop back to our, our friends and our video as they were working better on learning their neighbors. And they made a few assumptions to didn't they? So we're going to uh, check back in and see if they've learned their lesson on how to love their neighbors. Hey, John. What you up to? Hey, Bubba. What's going on? Hey, I'm going to build me a lemonade stand, but I need to borrow your miter saw, okay? Okay. Let me go get it. Did you say lemonade stand? Yeah, I did. What are you doing? Well, there's the neighbor girls. They want to sell lemonade at the neighborhood garage sale this mm -hmm. weekend. I told him I'd build him a real one. Mm -hmm. Bob, um, you don't like kids? Yeah, but... So, were you talking to the neighbor girls, Katie and Sarah? Yeah, I guess I was. They even drew me this picture. Kind of reminds me of my grandkids. Is that a tear in your eye? No, allergies, man. <laughs> All right. I was getting a little concerned. I thought maybe you were getting some feelings in that black hole that you call a heart. Well, if you have to know, I am a little concerned. If I had a daughter that had a husband deployed to Afghanistan and I was, she had two little kiddos running mm -hmm. around, I'd want somebody to step up for her and help her out. Wouldn't you? All right, look at you. This neighboring thing isn't so hard, is it? <laughs> Nah, but you know, in all seriousness, I did want to tell you something else too, but don't have the big one on me. Well, you, Bob, your cancer's not back, is it? Oh, no, no, nothing like that. Yeah. I just want to tell you about Big Jim. Who's Big Jim? Big Jim, you know, the guy that walks that little foo-foo dog. Oh, the one that's dog that wasn't manly yeah. enough for you. Yeah. yeah, that was him. I was talking to him the other day. Talking or yelling, Bob, because my last memory of you were yelling at him about getting off your front yard. Well, I found out he wasn't so bad. He was cleaning up after that little mutt. 
and I went out and talked to him. Found out he's a Marine just like me. You know what else? He's a detective in the police department now. Not too manly of a man there, is he, Bobby? No, better yet, though. He's a Cubs fan, and he invited me over to watch the Cubs. But no Cardinals fans allowed. All right, so you and Big Jim. Yeah. Lemonade stand. Yeah. You know, if you're not careful, they're going to start calling you Mr. Softy instead of the crotchety old buzzard that I've grown to know and love. <laughs> ha ha, real funny, John. Maybe you could be a little more neighborly, huh? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Big Jim has a neighbor, widow neighbor that needs her deck fixed. It's going, getting rotten. And he thought maybe we could come over and help. You want to go over and help him out? <laughs> All right. You know, and be the neighborly thing? All right. All right. Count me in. Okay. Count me in. But you know what? You um, Let's keep this on the down low, can we please? Because if the other people in the neighbor happen to see us, they might expect us to do it for them too. <laughs> well, if they do, you know, they could just call us three amigos or three friendly neighbors helping out. We don't really want the neighborhood going downhill now, do we? No, we don't. All right, let me go get my saw, but Bobo, just on a serious note, buddy, my life will be pretty dull without you around here, so don't worry, I'm not going to hug you. Okay, John. <laughs> Well, I'm glad there was a happy ending with that story. <laughs> I was a little worried with the first one that they were going to be grumpy the whole time. Well, loving your neighbor is what we've been talking about today. And, and even though it's a simple, con, a simple thing to do, it can sometimes feel like a big thing. So I hope that you can take those little bitty steps that it takes just to step out um, in faith with God at your side, leading us, um, and in step into those relationships. I've got a quote from Restore Strategies, which is uh, which came across my email. It's like a missional organization, and I get their emails. Um, and there was a quote that jumped out at me that says, a local missions leader must be a curious learner of their city. You know, I think if we really want to be a leader, uh, it's important that we stay curious. That's my big thing, stay curious, but that we're always open to learning new things. We don't assume we have all the answers. And I think that really applies, um, that we're curious that God's at work. We know God is working in people's lives, in individual lives, in our communities. Um, are we being curious about what God is doing where? Um, when, we, when we interact with people or we, we engage our community, God's already working. It's really just our job to come kind of like walk alongside and continue the work that he's doing and help support it. So I hope that we can continue to stay curious about what God is already doing and support that ministry. Um, another resource I want to name, certainly Mission Insight, huge resource. That's why we gave it its own time slot um, to have plenty of time for you guys to get to know what that does. Um, there's a podcast I want to mention um, called Love Thy Neighborhood. Um, I know I met somebody, um, we used to live near Louisville, and I met somebody through a religious organization um, that runs this program, and they make a really good podcast. It's not necessarily United Methodist, but they run a nonprofit organization where they have internships for college students to engage in justice ministry in Louisville area. So they have, um, one, of the, one of the projects they do is they make this really good podcast, and every episode is really kind of digging deep into an issue um, about their neighborhood. So, I mean, they cover everything about foster care, um, the sex industry, racism. They have one just on neighboring, and they actually talk about some of these, um, the nine square grid that we um, have talked about today. So highly recommend that as a podcast, just something as, we, as you begin to explore what it looks like to do ministry in your neighborhoods. They have some good resources through that podcast um, that you can, you can check out. So um, Reminder for before I wrap up to turn in your evaluations and everything, but I had a wonderful time being with you. I'm going to turn things over to Jim and give him uh, 10 or 15 more minutes if he wants it because we've got some time and, uh, to wrap us up and send us forth in prayer. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Anne has something. Sorry. I wanted to share another thing that mm -hmm. I didn't know if you'd be sharing it or not, or Randy. I don't Thank you. Um, I, I was an FCJ coach for about 20-some churches around the state, and one of the things that we did in, in what you've just been talking about was to give um, uh, the churches community interview questions. 
And they were the same questions that were asked of community leaders. And almost always within a church, somebody knows the school superintendent, the police chief, the, um, the person who works in children's wel welfare, the principals of the school. They would take that community interview sheet and everybody would ask the same questions and write down, then they would bring them all back together. And it was amazing, people who thought they knew their communities inside out when you talk to the people who are in the hands and feet and, and in the weeds every day, you find out needs that you had no idea existed. So the mission insight is good, but you also get a personal reflection of a number of areas of needs in your community by doing those. And then you take back that information and you pair it with the kinds of gifts and passions that exist within your congregation. Because even if you find out that there might be a huge need in an area, but nobody in your church really has that passion, ability, or aptitude, then that's not a good match for your church. And God is calling you to do something else. So that's another, mm -hmm. anybody that's interested in that, let me know, and we'll make sure that that's on the website, the West District website. It's called Community Interviews. Okay, good, thank you. And just, to close, before I hand it over to Jim, um, you know, when I go out and talk places, I remind people we're, you know, a connectional church, um, and when we're all doing this, you know, the, the I think this kind of represents it. When this this is me and my neighbors, when I'm loving them um, and doing that, and somebody else over here is loving their neighbors, and you know, we can make a really big impact. We really are missionaries for God sent forth into our own neighborhoods and communities. So I hope that as you go forth, you embrace that and live as missionaries. So, you want to close us up? So about how many how many minutes? Uh, fifteen. So and then then we're through for the. Okay, all right. Whew, that's a lot of stuff, isn't it? So have we, have we got sound going for me? Um, so I'd like to ask you again, as I did a little bit earlier. Uh, so from this afternoon, would you mind just turn around and find an, a neighbor and just share what jumped out at you this afternoon? What 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 was an aha? Like oh, I didn't thought about that. Just real quick, two or three minutes. Thank you. Um, I, I want to take about 30, 40 seconds here. Anybody want to shout out what jumped out at you this afternoon? Time to go. <laughs> Not literally, but. No, 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 no. Yeah. Go and be missionaries. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody else? Okay, yeah, that's, that's a great tool. So uh, we're going to have about 15 minutes, and, and uh, I thought, well, John just stood up here, and, and, if, and if I didn't intercept him, he's going to fall asleep. So I'm going to ask him a few questions. But I want to I finish these last 15 or so minutes on the mission field, because you've heard about mission insight. So in, in 1968, some research out of Fuller Theological Seminary, it was the first time it was demonstrated that more people by far did not attend church in America than does. And it's also about the time, uh, other work by sociologists uh, often equate about that same time with a term you may have heard called cocooning in the United States of America, where people began to be isolated within their own homes, right? Uh, architecture, residential architecture was garage in the back, fence around, you never saw a neighbor, all that kind of came together. And so uh, the church, even our denomination, we all kind of settled by then and, and we just weren't aware that neighborhoods and the concept of neighbors was changing uh, extensively. Plus, transportation to churches became such that people didn't go to neighborhood churches anymore, they just went to easy to reach churches. So all that is kind of built up to create a situation which your conference in your district is addressing. So John, my hat, uh, my hat goes off to you. Uh, thank you. So, so finally, we who are in mainline churches, Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, Lutheran, finally we caught on to this idea of the mission field instead of talking about the community. Because Fuller it made the point that if you were a missionary going to a foreign land, what's the first thing you had to do to communicate the gospel? Learn the language, learn the language and learn the, the culture, the customs. So we're kind of, we, we are late 
coming to the game, but we're beginning to come to the game. And so what we realize now, there are really there are three mission fields. When we speak of the mission field, now I'm from Texas, so that's a cotton field. But you know what the Bible says, the fields are what? Ripe. I've just pointed out seven out of ten people have no faith relationship. I mean, I don't expect there's ever been a time in history when we have been needed more as disciples than today. Um, so we break this down to look at three mission fields. So the first mission field is, my friends, your heart. Okay? It's your heart. I, I'm going to use an old, ba we have, I, I'm an old Baptist term here. But we've got to get converted again ourselves and our own heart to realize that Jesus calls us to reach new people, not, not just to maintain a nice church. Am I, can I get an amen out of this? Amen. So it's, you know, it's your heart. And, and Jesus, remember that story when Jesus was walking on the hillside and he looked down on Jerusalem and the scriptures tell us, Jesus what? Here's my question for you and I'm going to ask John about this. Friends, what breaks your heart? What causes you to weep? The best ministries from a church come from a broken heart of a layperson. Um, you know, as Randy pointed out, I mean, you know, this church saw, you know, a, a particular need. It broke their heart. And, and I don't know what breaks your heart, but, but I, John, in your district, I'm putting you on the spot here, what are some of the things here that would break a heart? Mediocrity, indifference, lack of passion, a sense of lack of importance of the need of the call. Mm -hmm. um, in, in this district, we have really pushed to try to encourage, empower, equip, and send our folks to live as though they are the the life giving breath of Christ and and to share that with others and it it just breaks my heart that I don't see that energy passion throughout all of our churches and all of our pastors when John let me here, here's a good exercise uh, so here's what I, I, I just uh, over my experience, here's what I'd suggest. The start of the year. So you can plan now. Do, do you, most of you all start like January, start of a new year for ministry planning and programming? My kind of... So here's a, here's a couple of good things that churches tell me makes all the difference to re-energize a church that's kind of frustrated and it's been like it's been on that treadmill but not really getting traction. So uh, first of all, use Mission Insight. Uh, is a great report. This is the, a tremendously underutilized resource in all of our churches. Consider doing this too. At the start of the year or getting ready for the year, get your leaders together. And, um, and, and Mission Insight has a tool. I don't know if, I don't want to say anything I shouldn't say here. But, so Mission Insight has a tool that allows you to draw a map. So better, it's great to use the radius which is, you know, an X marks your church and then a radius three miles, five miles. But often that gets so much information that is not pertinent to your particular mission field. And it just becomes like a habit, like, well, here's our radius. So you can get your congregation thinking mission field if you start the year by getting down or all around the table and saying, well, let's all decide tonight for this year. What's our mission field? And somebody will say, well, we go up to 10th Street. And another, no, we go to the creek. Just hash it out. Draw in the mission field. It gets people thinking mission field. Because we are missionaries in our own land. So draw it in. It's an easy tool. Click save. And then from then on, all the studies you do will just be of that, what you consider to be your mission field. And we recommend churches, John, start to do this every year. I mean, because it will change. Uh, not The mission field won't change. Your understanding of it will change. Jim, Jim in, in the Indiana Conference, we've been asked to have a wildly intentional goal mm -hmm. by 2020 to have all pastors and clergy living out life-giving 
uh, relationships for Jesus Christ and sharing them to everyone. So leading up to that, in 2017, we're asking our congregations and pastors to be answering the question what it means to be more missional. Not mission-minded, but missional. 2018 is building uh, awareness of the mission fields in our community, which is what you just spoke about. 2019 is building the relationships with those needs of that mission field so that we can culminate in 2020, that we can be as fruitful as possible. So what you've helped us with today is just walked us right alongside what our yeah. main goal for the for the Indiana conference is doing. So uh, little did you know that you fed right into our play and yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but we want to say glory to God for that. Sure. What what would be the the best piece of information that we could take away today from you to help help us live out our fruitfulness as we leave this place today. So, uh, y'all heard John's question. So, I, before I give what I think is going to is the most important, single most important thing I could leave with you, uh, uh, follow up on that mission field again. Ask yourselves instead of just gazing at the problems and glancing at the possibilities, gaze at the future and ask yourselves as members of the church personally, what breaks my heart? What causes me to weep? Just share that amongst yourselves. It elevates the conversation. And if you find something that, you know, like I was working with a, a church in Iowa, small church, almost, almost gone, elderly church. But they began to realize when they started Mission Insight, then they got them thinking mission field. And then when they drove around, they noticed how many billboards were out there uh, uh, about uh, unwanted pregnancies. And they sat around and, it, and they realized these elderly folk, these were great, great grandparents and grandparents, but what broke their heart was the thought of all the teenage pregnancies, teenage mothers unprepared. And so they decided to do something about it. And they went to the hospital, local hospital, they went to doctors, and they, they just basically set up a time where they met regularly and they put together materials for an unwed mother to take home with her baby. And, it, and then they began to make relationships when they would take them. And it just, I, we just watched in amazement as that church just turned around because the ministry they took on was the ministry that broke their heart. Now, here's the thing. From my perspective, what I'd share with you all, and, uh, and I'm going to share it in terms of a story since that's what I do, is this. Friends, um, start with your culture. You know, Jesus said, seek ye first. What? Now, I'm not equating culture with the kingdom of God, but I am saying this. Jesus understood the importance of prioritizing. So I hope before you start coming to all kinds of things that you can do, that you ask yourself, what is the culture of our church? What is, how, how do we want to go about doing our ministry? How, what do we want to be known for? Start with the culture. So, um, um, when I, when I pastored in Flower Mound, um, we had a great men's group, and we, we went crazy. We always say, just go crazy, have some great fun, do some great things. And we decided, uh, our men's group took a fishing trip to Brazil, not Indiana. The real Brazil. And so... Um, Here now, be uh, careful. So I have to... So one of the guys, one, one of the guys that went on the trip sent this out. Now... We went fishing in the Amazon River Basin, if you're a fisherman, uh, for peacock bass, which is great fun. So the following is from the United States Government Peace Corps Manual uh, for its volunteers who work in the Amazon jungle. And it tells you what to do if you're attacked by an anaconda. You know, the big snake, anaconda. Number one, if you're attacked by an anaconda, do not run. The snake is faster than you are. Number two, Lie flat on the ground. Put your arms tight against your side. Your legs tight against one another. Number three, tuck your chin in. Number four, 
the snake will come and begin to nudge and climb over your body. Number five, do not panic. <laughs> I'm not making this, that's what it really says. Number six, after the snake has examined you, it will begin to swallow you from the feet and always from the end. Permit the snake to swallow your feet and ankles. Do not panic. Number seven, the snake will now begin to suck your legs into its body. You must lie perfectly still. This will take a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Number eight, when the snake has reached your knees, slowly and with little as movement as possible, reach down, take your knife, and very gently slide it into the side of the snake's mouth and between the edge of its mouth and your leg, then suddenly rip upwards, severing the snake's head. Number nine, be sure you have your knife. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking, right? That should have been a little higher up on the list, you think? I can tell you, this is the way it is with culture. Um... Too often, we, we have fallen into the trap of thinking that our church's culture is the sum total of all the things that we do. And we don't take it intentionally. But I learned this working with Southwest Airlines. Your culture is the launch pad for everything you do. Start with the culture. Start with your mission field. Start with what breaks your heart. Make some conscious decisions. This is how we want to operate. This is how we want to work together. This is how we want to live together. So we want to be in community together. Start with your culture, and then all things else will follow. And so today, what I've been trying to share is the best place to start creating culture is with hospitality. And it's the easiest, and it's the best place. But pastors especially, you're the leaders. Um, get away, do some thinking. You know, what God see in me? What, what, what do I have to bring to this church? And live authentically out of your culture and yourself. Um, and then ask these mission field questions. You know, what, what breaks my heart? Jim, your, your book is intriguing. The, the concept of being clipped in is you're, you're in it. And when you're strapped in and the pedals and you're strapped... You either have two options, one to keep pedaling, to keep on the task, or two to either, I guess, just slow down and fall off, or to have somebody yeah. help you in the transition. So I, I was really intrigued by the title and the content of the book, how it was about press on. You know, keep the good faith, fight the good fight, toward the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It wasn't all in there, but what I gleaned out of that is that we're on a journey. And it's something that can't be done in the first 50 meters or 100 kilometers or yards. It, but it has to start. I know the, the Chinese statement, uh, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So I, I believe you've helped us along with Allison and Randy, to help us get to a next step. And I hope that we can start running. Running with fruitfulness, running to be equipped, running to do the work that God's called us to do. And whatever we call it, whether it's hospitality, whether it's being just kind to one another, loving one another, being fed with integrity for one another, and living out relationships, We've got to be the church instead of just looking at the church. Right. And that's why that second mission field is, the first is the heart, the second mission field is the church. We've got to, our, churches, our church members have got to be converted again to realizing it's not about me, that it's about reaching a mission field out there. And you can see from this statistic, uh, churches nationwide, 80% of people think the main purpose of the church is to take care of them. And you can see why our churches are coming inward and, you know, and aging, and, and aging out. And so it makes such a difference. Now, we have to take care of our people. Please don't misunderstand. You know, if Randy is a pastor, um, if, he, 
if he's at his church, if you're a pastor, you go to your church and, and you, you stretch, uh, you know, you love your people, love them more than you stretch them to grow, to get beyond themselves, to find their neighbors. If you love them more than you stretch them, you'll soon be known as their chaplain. And nothing wrong with chaplains, it's just, it's hard to grow a church with a chaplain. But if the pastor goes and stretches the congregation more than she loves the congregation, she'll soon be known as their former pastor. I mean, that's just the way it goes, you know? So it's a matter of balance, and that's why you need each other, you know, in districts and, and in, in collegiality to, to help balance out my focus, you know, to have a good balance between opening that front door, finding new people, and loving your existing people. And without, without that balance, it, it'll be very difficult. But even with the balance, uh, my hope and my prayer is that the church will focus outward to the mission field of the needs of that community. The third mission field is the people outside. But before you get out there, be sure your own heart is right. Be sure you're focusing the church to create a culture in the church that's outwardly focused. One of the comments that Bishop Tremble usually asks the extended cabinet around the table, are all hearts clear? I, I would like to think if we could do that with hospitality in our local churches, and if every person could answer that question, are all of our hearts clear of the clutter, of the frustration, of the bickering, of the disappointment, and concentrate solely on reaching people for Jesus Christ? to be transformed in our own lives, in our church, and in our world. I think that's the calling that Christ has intended for us in the first place. Amen. John, thank you so much for the invitation. Are we, is our time up? And would you mind, can I give you a Texas prayer to close? Now, I, need, I probably need a, Allison, I'm probably going to need your detail logistical help here. Because what I'd like to ask, can we just circle up, make, grab a hand and circle up? I don't know how to do that in this room. Allison, can you help out? Maybe, maybe just big circle, oval, something. Thank you. We're figuring this all out. Just cut across the pew there. Grab a hand. Let's get all circled up. <laughs> so is this your idea of Texas Hold'em? <laughs> Hey, thank you all for uh, allowing me to be a part of, part of your day and getting to know you as a family more uh, here in, in Indiana. And I hope this has been a, a good day for you and, and that, you'll, uh, that you'll tell friends and, and others, uh, your bishops and DSs, if you're not from this, uh, from this district. We're just, I think people who, who are beyond the local church level, like myself, and love the church, we're, we're all just trying our best to change the culture you know, create a culture of growth. So to remind us of that, would you humor me just one last time and just turn around and take a hand. <laughs> just, um, just to remind us that we are called to focus outward. To reach people that have uh, no connection to any church home to reach people, to find people, to see our neighbors, to see what they are struggling with and what life is bringing to them and how we might be of help. To focus outward, to, to find people that we've never yet found and that we might be the personally, each of us, the bridge over which someone walks. I know this, friends, in the church, you, you know this. If you focus outward, you will get resistance. So we've got to have each other's back, supporting one another, 
So anywhere around the district or in your church, if you're a lay person and you hear some yin yang and a complaining about what the church is doing, just stand up for each other and lovingly just say, hey, look, we're all just trying to do the best we can to be the church God wants us to be. Amen? Amen. Thank you all for being here. God bless.